Okay. Um, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you again for joining us every Tuesday for our clinical care webinars. Uh, it's exactly 18 hours on my side, and I think that uh, we should start. I'm taking into cognizance um, issues around load shedding and everyone struggling with the network. So I will keep my video on just for the introductions piece. And then immediately after that, I will switch it off as we continue with today's talk. So yeah, so you are welcome <coughs> to the clinical care uh, webinars. Today we are going to discuss the significance and clinical management of persistent low level viremia in HIV infected patients. And I hope that uh, it is an exciting topic that we will learn from and importantly to start to understand why we do not want to smell any virus, you know, preferably, but we do have patients who have some detectable um, viral loads. As usual, um, just to say that you are welcome, then, then I will just introduce the platform and today's uh, presentation. Um, to remind everyone that our mission for this platform is to improve patient care through sharing of educational resources and evidence-based education. We hope to achieve this by enhancing your clinical practice and competence, and hopefully you start to share um, these uh, recordings as we share them, you know, the links to these webinars with your colleagues so that we can continue to be um, relevant and improve our clinical skills um, on an ongoing basis. Um, this is today's uh, uh, webinar. I'm going to be the presenter. Uh, Dr. Segule is still not yet back uh, from his leave. Uh, but the topic for today is to talk about the significance and clinical management of persistent low viremia in HIV infected patients. The rationale being that as a goal, of the HIV therapy, one of the goals is to sustain suppression of the plasma viral load below detectable limits uh, based on what the labs are able to detect. Most people sort of agree that when we say suppression, we mean a viral load of less than 50 copies per mil. However, um, if you look at treatment guidelines around how we interpret suppression, how we interpret um, treatment failure, you'll find that um, there is more that needs to be done as I'm going to show you um, today. So this webinar will review then the incidence, so how common is low level viremia, some risk factors and potential consequences of low level HIV viremia, especially if we do not pay um, attention to that. Um, I am not alone um, today I'm with a colleague of mine <clears throat> um, whom I work very closely with here in Mpumalanga, Dr. Christy Jackson. I have known her, I don't know for how many years we have worked to support the province together. Currently, she's a senior medical technical advisor for right to care um, in Mpumalanga, supporting the province in terms of response to infectious diseases, you know, TB, HIV, including um, COVID-19. She is a medical doctor, but she also has a postgraduate um, diploma in HIV management, which is from the college, and also a master's in tropical medicine and international health. So she's an all-round infectious um, disease um, clinician, and I think uh, she's going to add a lot of insights um, into this particular topic. Um, I was lucky also when I requested also a colleague who works uh, for Health System Trust, Dr. Tenigo, um, Koza. Um, I've met her also in some of the engagements, in some of the trainings and meetings. So she's quite someone who's quite experienced in infectious diseases. She also has vast experience working with public, private, and developmental agencies for the past um, 27 years. So she has a lot of experience to share with us. But importantly, she's also a clinical virologist um, as a specialist. And I think this topic uh, is something that we are going to learn a lot from her. She also leads um, ACC, or what we call Advanced Clinical Care in the HIV World, where she supports the department and public health facilities to care for unstable uh, patients. So I don't want to really uh, waste your time. 
please forgive me. I'm going to switch off my video for now, just to ensure that uh, you do not struggle with network because a lot of people um, have made comments about that as feedback via email. Let's then um, indulge um, in this particular topic and look at uh, some of the uh, key areas we are going to cover. So for today, at the end of this particular um, session, you know, is to help you to define what low level viremia is and to explain some of the factors that might contribute to low level viremia or a, a detectable viral load for a leg of a better weight, right? But also for us eventually to agree on how we are going to approach the assessment of patients who present with high viral loads and then summarize then the management to say, now that you have picked it up, you have assessed the patient, you know, how do you go about approaching um, such patients? Um, just to make sure, because I really want to make uh, this particular session to be quite um, interactive. Let me start by checking up on you, you know, as we start, um, how are you feeling? So it's a practice session to see if you are able to engage <laughs> yes, it's, a, it's not a clinical uh, question, so just uh, try to advise us, you know, how you are feeling. We must take that into account and not focus just on clinical issues. Unfortunately, we have 30 seconds for this particular question, so I'm going to stop and encourage you that in the next uh, few questions, try to participate. So I'll just show you that most of us uh, seem happy. Others are okay. Um, we have people who are sad and those who are not sure. Um, all I can do really is to inspire you through this particular presentation and hoping that ultimately at the end, those who are just okay will be happier and those who are sad will feel better about themselves. And uh, you know, we end this particular webinar um, on a high note. So please be watchful of uh, these uh, polling questions as I'm going to be posing um, more questions to you. So here's a, a short scenario to set uh, the scene. So you have a 31 year old male patient who presents to you with a viral load of 600 copies, right? So he's on ARVs for more than a year. His viral load um, is 600 copies. So, I mean, uh, before we discuss this further, let me check with you, you know, um, if some, if a patient presents with a CD4 count of, I mean, a viral load of 600 copies after being on treatment for 12 months and is taking an NNRTI-based regimen with efavirenz, what would you do? What would be some of the things um, that you want um, um, to do at this point in time? Um, I will give you 10 more seconds uh, so that I can show you um, what most of you are saying. It's anonymous, we won't know what you selected. You can select more than one answer. Let's just try and participate to make this exciting. All right, I'm going to stop <laughs> right there. So yes, I'm just showing you the results now. Uh, most of you said enhanced adherence counseling, then followed by repeating the viral load, um, continuing the regimen. And there's a small number who said, I will stop efavirenz and give the lutegravel. And some said I will switch to second line ART. All right. So I'm not going to give you any lectures on this particular question, but please keep this case in mind as we proceed um, with the uh, next, uh, as we talk through the theory. So it's important to know that whenever we initiate a patient on ARBs, our goal is to achieve maximum viral suppression. Our goal really is to ensure that we do not have any patient who has a detectable viral load. And hopefully most of our patients have an increasing um, CD4 count and they do not have you know, any AIDS associated diseases like your stage three, stage four, WHO conditions. And ultimately we strongly believe in today's world that if a person is virologically suppressed, the risk of transmitting HIV to the next person is actually significantly minimized 
we also we actually believe that to zero you know but we are, we do not have that big confidence to say zero but we know that it's almost impossible to transmit hiv if it is not detectable um, in the blood here are some um, definitions today we are discussing low level viremia so what is this term it is the occurrence of at least one viral load measurement. So when the viral load, if you take blood and the viral load the result comes back to be between 50 and triple nine copies, right? In our South African guidelines, once the viral load crosses a thousand, we start to be very worried that the patient might be failing treatment. We might repeat it to confirm, but usually when the viral load is between 50 and triple nine, there's some uh, uh, gray area there. Um, which we, we need to work around. Then there's a viral blip. When you say it's a viral blip, it means a patient had a high viral load, which later on became um, suppressed. So this high viral load was not sustained um, over um, a long period of time. Then we have persistent low level viremia. So that means now we have two consecutive episodes so this viral load between 50 and 1,000 was not detected just once, but it was detected uh, more than once, you know, um, um, over time. And virological failure in the South African context, we talk about a viral load of more than 1,000 copies on two occasions. These viral loads are taken two to three months apart with intensive adherence support uh, between the two viral loads. So this is the key definitions we will use uh, for today. Um, now, how common um, is this low level viremia, a viral load between 50 and 1,000? In my clinical experience and the type of calls and cases I review on a daily basis, I want to say it's quite common. Right, for one reason or the other, right? And usually presents the first time as a blip. So someone who has a high viral load and later on they suppress, but then they have these repeated uh, blips. Uh, the majority, the minority, sorry, may progress to higher degrees of viremia. So someone presents with a viral load of 250. Um, um, later on, when you repeat it, it's now 2,000, 3,000, 10,000. It's quite common. And, uh, and approximately 8% of patients would reach, you know, who reach suppression subsequently develop high viral load. So this is quite um, an important topic uh, for us to discuss today. So what do we know about this low level uh, viremia, right? So number one, the theory is that we believe that these patients have a very high storage. This is what we call HIV reservoirs. This is HIV that stays replicating slowly in our lymph nodes, the spleen, your gut um, in children, the thymus, you know, sometimes in the brain and so on. And these reservoirs, reservoirs sometimes release you know, um, this virus into the blood and then it becomes um, detectable even if patients um, are taking ARVs at that point in time. And generally we've got two kinds of patients. Whenever you see a viral load of 400, you have a patient who's really, you know, a good patient who's fully adhering to their treatment. But sometimes when you take proper history, you realize that some patients are people who are not adhering, especially the ones who like taking treatment when they know that they are going to be visiting you <laughs> at your practice. We call them, you know, white coat adherents. They only adhere when they know that um, they've been booked. Um, some studies show that low level viremia might be likely to patients who are taking boosted PI, Yolopina vest and, and Retona vest. Um, however, I think now studies that are coming out generally are showing that if a patient presents with low level viremia, they have a greater risk of eventually failing treatment. And some of these patients even developing mutations, sometimes non-significant mutations or even uh, significant mutations. And I think Tenyogo will advise us more um, whether these mutations are important um, or not. What makes it a bit complex is that more than half the time, these patients might not be sick. So they have a viral load of 600 you know, um, you repeat it, it's 650, they are clinically stable. So the question is, do you need to switch drugs? Should we accept this viral load, you know? And another thing that we really don't know is to say, if someone has a viral load of uh, 300, are they infectious because they are on ARVs? You know, what is the risk of transmitting HIV 
um, to, to, to the next person. We do know in the PMTCT program, for example, that we do not prefer any form of a detectable virus because um, our infants can easily be infected even at those low um, viral loads, right? Should, should we just let it go and say, well, it is below a thousand, <laughs> there's no need you know, um, to do much? Well, the first thing is that there is significant risk of developing um, resistance. And ours is to try to figure out which patients are likely to be having this viral load that is high because of poor compliance versus those who are very compliant and failing um, um, to suppress. Um, some and, and on the other side is that this particular virus, though it might have mutated, you'll find that it is less fit. It is unable to infect more cells. Therefore, it is less transmissible or it is unlikely you know, to grow and become a very high population of viruses for this particular uh, patient. Um, but however, some patients do end up with immunological treatment failure, and that is what we need to watch out for. Um, the, the third last bullet there is something that is quite important because as long as there's the virus in the blood, we know that our immune system will continuously respond um, to this virus by releasing, you know, your interleukins and some of the inter, in, I mean, uh, anti-inflammatory um, um, uh, markers and chemicals. And the persistent and continuous activation of the immune system is associated with some of the malignancies, with some of the complications that are associated um, with HIV. So we generally do not like a detectable viral load because it is also not good long-term uh, for, for our patients. Half of them would progress to fail treatment. Some of them might even clinically progress to clinical um, treatment failure, right? So what is the effect then of this low level viremia during antiretroviral? Remember, we're talking about a virus that is replicating when a patient is taking ARV. So the patient is taking the ARVs on a daily basis. This particular virus, it might be slowly replicating, but the issue is it is exposed to, to the drugs, right? So there is therefore an increased risk of virological failure. And you can see the hazard ratios of up to 2.6, so two to three more times likely that if you have low level viremia, you'll eventually fail. And you would probably need to be switched to second line ART. I'm raising these issues because in clinical practice, we do find ourselves in situations where we switch uh, patients to single drugs, especially DTG, transitioning patients when they have a viral load of 400. In South Africa, most patients who have these low level viremias are not even in the clinics. They are picking up their medicines outside of the clinics through programs like CCMDD. They are continuing to have those low viral loads. We are transitioning them between regimens. And what is the implication and impact of introducing a single drug into a regimen where a patient is not fully suppressed. Yes, the viral load is more than 1,000, but it might be 800 or 600, as is the case uh, that we are discussing uh, up today. That brings me then to the second question I want to ask you. So at what viral load? After you know everything that I've discussed, the risks, you know, um, I mean, what at what viral load would you consider to change a regimen? What is your uh, view. I mean, I'm going to share with you some information, but I want to get your view. Um, what are you comfortable with? What do you believe should be um, the, 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 and I wonder what uh, Christy and uh, the Nuko think. I'm going to hear from them because we know what the guidelines say, but the science also tells us <laughs> other things which I think is going to be uh, quite uh, interesting um, on that note. All right, so I'm going to stop now in two seconds time and just show you your result that most of you are saying I will only switch a regimen if the viral load is more than a thousand. And I know uh, it means we have a lot of government officials. That is what our guidelines say and we must stick to the guidelines. Um, others are saying 50, 200, 500, and I see a 10,000 there. So let me not over, uh, you know, discuss it more than I should. 
let's then look at some of the, the issues, right? So what is the, 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 you know, is low level viremia associated with increased risk of virological fail? And you can see what the results which we will discuss now, particularly we are looking at patients who had a viral load between 200 and 500, which is way less than our cutoff um, in South Africa there. So if you look at the solid line there, is that those patients who had a viral load between 200 and 500, this is the solid line. And then you'll see that those who had um, no level, no, they had zero or no low level <laughs> viremia, or they had a low level viremia, which is less than 200, you could see. And what are we measuring? We're measuring the proportion of patients without virological failure. So in other words, if you compare these two groups here, patients who had a viral load less than 200, had a, a reduced risk of treatment failure compared to a patient who had a viral load between 200 and 499, right? So already you can tell that a viral load that is more than 200 is quite uh, high in terms of our defining whether these patients have failed treatment um, um, or not, and saying that even in the context of low-level viremia, we have to be very cautious because some patients who have a viral load that is not more than 1,000, but this particular viral load might be 300 or 400, a good proportion of those patients are eventually going to fail treatment, and they might have developed mutations uh, for argument's sake um, at that point um, in time, right? And then also, <clears throat> I found this particular uh, recent study published uh, in June um, this year, and they were just looking at patients who have low-level viremia, you know, is it associated with, you know, HIV-associated uh, mortality or not? And you would see that this was in Sweden, um, that patients with low-level viremia between 50 and 999 you know, um, this particular viral load was associated independently, right? Associated with an increased all-cause mortality, whether from HIV-associated conditions or non-HIV-associated um, conditions. If you just focus even just on HIV-associated causes of death, you will see that if you cluster all these patients from 50 up to 1,000, it is quite... Um, 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 significant. And this informs us that a high viral load is something that we do not want. If it is more than a thousand, we it's, it becomes even urgent. If it is between 50 and a thousand, we should not relax. We need to find ways to get that viral load controlled because some of those patients uh, might not do well um, with those particular um, uh, viral loads right there, right? And then there was a question to say, so if someone has, <clears throat> you know, um, a high viral load, how long does it take uh, for these patients to then get to immunological treatment failure? In this particular study, they were just looking at patients who are on protease inhibitor treatment. And you would see that it takes about three years. So if someone develops a high viral load on lopinavir, ritonavir, it would take them about three years before they they get to have some clinical um, uh, treatment failure or some features of treatment failure. That is why when you go then and look at our South African guidelines, when someone develops a high viral load on these robust uh, regimens with a high barrier to resistance, so someone taking a protease inhibitor or dolutegravir, we usually are not in a hurry um, um, to switch them. So our concern generally would be with patients who are taking your NNRTIs, efavirenz or nevirapine um, at any given time. So this is quite um, important. Uh, further um, review, looking at patients with low level viremia, um, are we able to detect resistance? Now, this is very complex. And I think uh, Denugo will also comment probably on this one because we know that if the viral load is less than a thousand, it becomes a bit difficult to detect mutations. So even in, in a population where we say we didn't find anything, you might find that the machines failed to pick up some of the mutations. But all in all, you know, you would find that if you have 10 patients with low level viremia, about three of them, about 30% of patients with low level viremia 
would have developed some mutations. This is quite um, um, important to say if the viral load is less than a thousand, if it's more than a thousand, we are sure that the patients are failing, you know, and we should probably wake up and, and repeat and confirm and, and consider switching. But a viral load that is between 50 and a thousand is equally uh, problematic and we shouldn't just, you know, um, um, avoid it, uh, delay assessing those patients. We need to figure out and, 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 and make that diagnosis as soon um, as possible. So before I share with you what the South African guidelines say about patients with low level viridia, let's start on the, on the right there. This is now the South African HIV Clinician Society, right? These are, general, these are open guidelines <clears throat> written for both uh, anyone who's got an interest in HIV, but they are predominantly used by the private sector because in the public sector, we only use guidelines that are signed off <laughs> by the minister. But what you would see, just pay attention to their definition of treatment failure day. Treatment failure defined by a viral load of more than 50 copies per mil on two consecutive measurements. In other words, if you apply the HIV Clinician Society guidelines, there is no discussion about low-level viremia, right? Because in these particular guidelines, as soon as your viral load crosses 50, uh, you should be waking up your patient for, for treatment failure. So, so this is quite um, important uh, for, for, for you to know that there is a actually a best practice <laughs> already that exists uh, in our country, you know, uh, to say that we should probably be looking at changing uh, the interpretation of treatment failure um, to 50 copies. But for the public sector, this change might mean a lot of things in terms of patient volumes, our ability to care for patients with higher viral loads than 50. And, and I think this is the discussion really that we are likely to have um, towards the end. Uh, maybe before I, I talk about WHO, at the bottom here, this is the American guidelines you can see updated June um, this year. And what is very interesting is that the Americans they talk about their definition of low level viremia. It's a, it's a viral load uh, that is between 50 and 200 day, you know? So a viral load between 50 and 200 it's a gray area where they'll probably give it back to a clinician to decide what they want to do, right? But any viral load above 200 in the, in the US is considered a, a, a possible um, treatment failure that needs to be evaluated, right? So, so you see now the differences between the countries and that's why this topic to say, so you know, what is the best approach uh, uh, to manage these patients uh, uh, correctly? And you'll find that now the World Health Organization, again, the updated guidelines up to July um, this year, they still talk about the viral load of more than a thousand, which is what the South Africa, this is how the South African guidelines um, are written because World Health Organization will make guidelines that are applicable, you know, for, for many people, right? But this particular uh, paragraph there is quite important because they would say for individuals with viral load, which are more than 50, but less than a thousand, you must maintain. So they say, continue the regimen, uh, provide enhanced adherence counseling and repeat the viral load after three months, right? Then consider switching if the second viral load is still between 50 and a thousand. So maybe that's a more fairer approach because I think the South African guidelines have sort of aligned to this particular um, interpretation. However, when you summarize the guidelines, when they now share in the same guideline, the review of the, 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 the clinical program decision by WHO, they tell us few things which are quite important still to say, uh, for them to recommend uh, this particular approach, the T1 studies were reviewed to examine low level viremia. And you would see that in these particular studies, low-level viremia was quite common. So 30% of the patient population in these studies had low-level viremia, which is a viral load between 50 and 1,000. A viral load between 50 and 200 
tended towards predicting future biological failure. So that means it's not an absolute thing that you should not discuss these patients or manage them. You still have to have a clinical process uh, to manage these patients. I think what I'm getting from all this is that a viral load of more than 200 copies is very important. As you would see from these particular studies, a viral load of more than 200 copies was statistically significantly it managed to predict future virological failure. And that means these particular patients have a high risk of developing um, uh, mutations um, um, in that space. However, the clinical significance of low-level viremia in patients taking dolutegravir or lopinavir ritonavir remains unclear. Now, if I was to summarize this, is that if you have a patient with low-level viremia, a viral load between 50 and 1,000, and this patient is taking a regimen, three drugs, but they contain dolutegravir or lopinavir, um, we are not going to be in a hurry, you know, to want to change or, or to make certain substitutions, right? But if they are taking a regimen which is backed up by efavirenz or nevirapine, we should probably think of acting because most of those patients, either they are already failing or they are going to fail shortly and they've already developed uh, mutations. So I thought this was quite um, empowering uh, for me <laughs> as well. Right, so now let's then summarize the South African guidelines so that then you can see um, where we are. So ultimately, we need to monitor patients. So if you start someone on ARVs in the South African context, the first viral load would be done when the patient has taken um, ARVs for six months. If they are suppressed, we then repeat the viral load at 12 months on ARVs. If they are still suppressed, then we can repeat um, these viral loads once a year. So the viral load is now the gold standard. That is what we use um, to monitor patients who are taking um, ARVs. The ultimate goal really is to get all patients to be fully suppressed. And for now, we use a, 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 a less than 50 copies per mil as our standard. If the viral load is more than 8,000, then we are sure in South Africa that we are very worried. Those patients, they require a proper assessment, support, um, you know, and we need to repeat the viral load in two to three months, and then we need to act on those results. If we've got two consecutive viral loads more than 1,000, we should be considering to change the patient to second line um, ART regimen, right? The worry and our topic today really is this particular group of patients to say, no, what do we do if the viral load is 500 uh, in the country? Because it's a gray area, you know, there. So we still have to do enhanced adherence because like I said, some of those patients are adherent, some really are not adherent and we need to help them and address side effects, drug-drug interactions, and then and repeat the viral loads um, as needed. A high viral load is, a, is an emergency in HIV care. You know, we should pick it up. Once you pick it up, you must say, what is the cause? Then address the problem, repeat the viral load. If the viral load is still not getting suppressed, you should consider um, switching your patient. And you'll see here, we are saying two new drug classes. Please avoid introducing one drug into a failing regimen. Doesn't matter how strong that drug is, even if it's DTG, let's try and avoid it, you know, as much as, as, as possible. Where you, are, where you find yourself in a corner, maybe the best um, thing is to, is to consider changing um, the regimen and introducing two new um, classes um, of drugs right there, right? So uh, the management of low level viremia. So you would see that the guidelines, these are now algorithms from the HIV guidelines, right? If a patient has taken ARVs for more than six months, we should do a viral load at six months. If it is suppressed, we are happy. We follow, you know, the schedule as prescribed. If it's more than a thousand, we are worried. We need to do enhanced adherence counseling, pick up the problems, address the problems, repeat the viral load and make a decision if we need to be switching uh, a patient who's taking an NNRTI-based regimen. If they are taking dolutegravir or lopinavir, you know, we would need to wait for at least uh, two years before we can consider switching. But uh, you'll see that if the viral load is between 50 and 8,000 there, you have to still assess the patient, implement your interventions, and repeat the viral load 
um, in three months time. And hopefully, you know, when it comes back, it is suppressed. If it is still um, between this particular period, uh, I mean, between this uh, range, 50 to 8,000, we then need to decide uh, what we want to do. And I'll show you the algorithm. We might even need to repeat the viral loads again. But the golden rule really, remember some of these patients already have mutations, especially if the viral load is more than 500 there, you know. So you need to be very cautious about your decision to just introduce one drug. You probably need to consider um, classifying your patient as treatment failure and switching them um, as needed right there. These are some of the causes of a high viral load, drug-drug interactions, patients who excrete ARVs very quickly, those who cannot absorb the drugs, sometimes it's because of drug-drug interactions, um, genetics, people who are not metabolizing the drugs as expected, wrong dose, wrong prescription, poor potency, so the combination of this regimen was not formulated you know, properly. But don't forget that personal issues, alcohol use, substance use, uh, mental health issues, you know, also affect, you know, adherence significantly. And a combination of these issues would lead to reduced drug levels, then leading to the virus starting to replicate in the presence of the virus. And we might end up, I mean, in the presence of the drugs, and we might end up with a resistant bug, which can also be transmitted um, to other people. So this is something that you would have to do for every single patient who has a high viral load. We need to assess them, you know, um, um, as needed right there. So the management approach is to say, one, confirm that this is low level viremia. Firstly, the viral load should not be more than 1,000, right? It should be between 50 and 1,000. And uh, the way to confirm is to repeat the viral load after three months. And between these two viral loads, um, you are doing some adherence and support issues. So you must assess adherence, review drug-drug interactions that might be making ARVs not to work properly, repeat the viral load. There might be a place for a genotype test, not necessarily in South Africa, but depending on the history of the patient, you know, like patients who fail, who have history of failing other drugs, um, we might need to consider checking if this is true resistance or not before we consider um, switching. You might need to do ART drug levels as indicated, you know, and if resistance is confirmed, then your patient probably needs to be switched um, to a better regimen with two to three fully active um, 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 drugs. And you'll see that in most guidelines, is it you'll find this sentence that there is limited guidance. We do not know exactly what to do if the viral load is between 50 and 1,000, but you will have to act based on a patient by patient basis, based on the context, your history, and your assessment of why your patient might be having um, a detectable viral load, right? So if you want to alter or change the regimen, it's important to assess adherence. Remember, changing the regimen does not improve adherence. You know, so if there's adherence issues, we have to deal with those. Um, um, check and confirm your viral load. What is the CD4 count? Sometimes the viral load is still 300, 400, but the CD4 count is declining. Your patient is starting to become sick. So we can't say you are waiting for a viral load to be more than a thousand. Therefore, we have to act uh, for those kinds of patients and then make sure that we decide on the, on the switches right there. So just to repeat, we monitor the viral load at six months, then 12 months, and then annually. If the viral load is between 50 and a thousand, you do your adherence assessment, where you assess for adherence, is your patient missing doses, forgetting, do they need social support? Are they currently having some infections that need to be treated? Are they taking the drugs correctly? What drug-drug interactions do they have? Is there an indication for a resistance test? If it's indicated as per the guidelines, you might want to do the test. Then you implement your interventions over three months, you repeat the viral load there uh, uh, um, at three months time, right? Patient is back. Remember you repeated the viral load at three months. Now the patient comes back and the viral load is still between 50 and 1,000. Because if it is suppressed, we are happy. If it's more than 1,000, we need to prepare for a switch. But now you had your first viral load there, which was a, a LLV, low-level viremia. You repeated after three months, it's still low-level viremia. Our guideline says 
repeat again <laughs> in six months time, right? And depending on that viral load in six months time, if it's the patient is suppressed, we are happy. If it's more than a thousand, uh, uh, we need to prepare for a switch if they're taking an NNRTI based regimen. If it's between 50 and, and 1,000, hmm, you continue with your enhanced utterance counseling and probably contact an experienced clinician in the HIV well, discuss the case and see if uh, maybe there's a need to switch um, this particular patient to a new um, regimen with two new active drugs um, right there, right? So to summarize what I was showing you, right? If you have a patient who has a persistent low-level viremia after taking ARVs for six months, and they are taking an NNRTI regimen, this is either a favorance or a verapin, right? They are started on ARVs. The first viral load is done at six months. The result comes back as 400 uh, for argument's sake. You will then do your enhanced adherence counseling, assessing for adherence, infections, correct those, drug drug interactions you know and assessing if there's a resistance right there and then repeat the viral load in 3 months time if after 3 months it's still 550 or 450 you then repeat the viral load in 6 months time if it's still between 50 and 1000 in south africa there is a recommendation that if the patient is taking a, a favorance based regimen and you have confirmed that this is low level viremia by repeating this viral load at three months and at six months and you still get low level viremia there is a recommendation in the guidelines that you must switch patients to tld and this has been the practice uh, you know in our clinics but i'm saying do it with caution because it's not something that uh, from my own experience and how i was taught hiv medicine i just don't like introducing changing one drug, a favorance to DTG, when I know that the patient has a virus and I can smell uh, this virus. So I don't like smelling <laughs> uh, the virus. Um, this is now where it's the same algorithm, but for a patient who's taking a good drug like DTG, as you can see right there. And the key thing here is that if a patient has low level viremia that you have confirmed, and they are taking dolutegravir or lopinavir, ritonavir, please don't be in a hurry to switch them. It is unlikely. And really, we need to wait for at least two years before we make that decision um, to switch um, this particular group um, of patients. All right, so I've given you a whole lot of information. All I'm saying is that there are risks that you have to take into account. If you look at other guidelines, they are very robust, including some guidelines here in South Africa, but also outside. Um, and science also tells us that if someone has a detectable viral load, we need to be very cautious because the, some of those patients already have mutations, they are likely to fail. Introducing one drug might be an issue and we need to consider evaluating them, assessing them, confirming low level viremia and probably deciding if we need to introduce um, two new drugs at that point in time. So yeah, so let me then uh, repeat this question again. A 31 year old male who comes to you with a viral load of 600 copies. He has been on tenofovir and tricitabine and effervorance for 12 months. What do you want to do? What do you want to do? I hope I didn't confuse you too much, but I hope you can, you know, programmatically uh, decide uh, what you want to do right there. All right, uh, it's 30 seconds, I'm going to stop. Uh, though I would have liked most of you to participate, but I'm going to stop now and then maybe show you the results. And uh, yes, I think it's presenting for the first time with a viral load of 600 copies. I think continuing uh, dealing with adherence number four there and then repeating the viral load in three months. It's as per the algorithm. Um, you know, yeah, you know, if you look at science, you might consider option three there uh, uh, later on if you can confirm that this viral load is not going anywhere. But at this point in time, option two and three are not indicated. We only have one measurement there which is 600. We need to evaluate the patient, support the patient. By God's grace, the patient will suppress again. 
and then uh, we can just continue or even give the patient a better regimen um, at that point in time. But then your patient comes back after three months, you supported your patient for three months, you know, you repeat the viral load test. However, the counselor tells you that the patient missed about one tablet every week. So he was taking uh, treatment holidays on weekends. He says, I am going to drink my alcohol, uh, you know. So the patient is missing like one tablet per week. The viral load comes back as 450. So we are moving from 600 to 450. Now you are looking, you are seeing the patient uh, again there. Now tell me, <laughs> what do you want to do? He had a viral load of 600. You repeated it in three months time. It is now uh, 450. Mm. Yes, yes, yes. Five more seconds. Mm. <laughs> superb, superb. All right, all right. So let me stop and show you um, your answer. So some of you said continue, enhance adherence counseling. Yeah, so here it becomes, so, you know, enhance adherence counseling, you can never go wrong, right? Um, in the South African government guidelines, right? You would have to continue treatment, conduct enhanced adherence counseling and repeat the viral load in six months time, right? If you use the HIV clinician society guidelines, this patient has two consecutive viral loads more than 50 copies after intensive support three months apart. So this patient would have failed. And in the HIV clinician society guidelines, you would need to switch this patient to a new regimen uh, you know, um, so, 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 and, and these are the issues. And the South African guideline does allow for option two there, <laughs> favorites uh, with Dolutegra there. Maybe if I continue, uh, 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 let's start. Christy, I hope you are there. Can you comment on, on, on what I've just said uh, on this case? Can you make your comments and what you think? I know it's a, it's a thin line somewhere there and there, but what's your take, uh, Christy? Yeah, thanks, Lasejo. Um, the, I agree that there's actually a few different ways that we can look at it, and it depends which guidelines we are following. Um, I'm definitely on board with doing enhanced adherence counseling. And then according to DOH guidelines, we can actually do a single drug switch in this case because it's got a low level viremia and it's not going up. It went from 600 to 450. So mm -hmm. that would allow us to change the patient from TEE to TLD and still be in, on board with the guidelines. What I was wondering when I was looking at these options now is then do we repeat the viral load after three months or then do we repeat it after six months? Because if we look at the algorithm and it says two low-level viremias, then you don't do it at three months, you stretch it to six months. Six months but now yeah. if we also do a regimen switch at the same time, do we still stick to the six months or we then take it to three months? I don't know if the guidelines are actually clear in that aspect. I might be tempted to do it after three months because in my opinion, after three months on TLD, a patient should be fully suppressed. Okay, um, yes. So there's a few ways to look at it. I would not put him on a Dolitegravir AZT3TC regimen at this point in time. Um, mm. I don't know. You can probably continue him on the current regimen or you can put him on TLD. Um, definitely an answer to at the end's counseling would be um, a main priority as well. Um, but there's, it's interesting how a, a seemingly straightforward case can actually turn out to be quite complex. <laughs> yes. Uh, do you go looking at the case? I mean, what's your take? And also, what do you think is the probability that this patient might have developed some mutations already? I don't know. What's your take? Uh, with this patient, uh, remember, we started with a viral load of 600, and three months later, it, it's uh, 450. In fact, yeah. I need to take a step back to go back to basics uh, for, to remind each other that, yes, we aim for viral suppression after six months. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we do viral loads, we are looking at like three categories. Category A, which would be a viral load that is suppressed, less than 50. And these category Bs are the ones that are usually problematic. But problematic, more especially taking into account patients that are on NNRTIs. And we know when we go back to our 
the history in terms of antiretrovirals here in South Africa, most of our patients have been on an NNRTI base. And part of the reason why the punting of uh, integrase inhibitors is on the basis of those mutations that have been seen with an NNRTI. Mm -hmm. So in this scenario, we, I mean, we know uh, having to switch from TEE to TLD, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I would, I would go for that in this scenario on the basis that dolutegrave, when you look at the potency, it's like, it's quite potent. You may have a patient starting with a viral load of millions, and we know within six weeks, it's able to suppress uh, mm -hmm. uh, the viral replication. So this patient, I would definitely switch to a, I'll, I'll be comfortable to, to, to switch to a DTG. But just like as what, uh, what Christy said, uh, when a person is failing, you will do three months. If after three months, it's still the issue of six months really, uh, will be doing a patient disservice because we also take into account the accumulation of mutations because yes, studies have shown that even with low level, like low level viremia, especially more than 200, you still have issues of uh, uh, accumulation of mutations. So you wouldn't want to stretch it uh, 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 that much. I would rather nip it with the lutegrave and you know that within six weeks, that patient would have uh, uh, suppressed and then you follow it up accordingly. Mm -hmm. Christy, come back. I want to ask you a different question. So if you switch to TLD, are you not worried that the uh, tenofovir uh, is already compromised and that might uh, make DTG to be some level of monotherapy or something like that? Um, um, are, are you not concerned about that? Yeah, so I think when, from what I remember, when the new guidelines came out and how they explained it is that there's, there was actually a lot of debate among the experts about whether to do this or not. And that was why they went for the guidelines saying you need to have at least two low level viremias, not just mm -hmm. one. Because what they were feeling, what, what the consensus that they end up reaching and why the guidelines are written as is, is if you are actually starting to build resistance and your first viral load of 600 copies was a sign that you've possibly lost your efavirenz and your tenofovir, then you would expect the next one to be higher. So okay. if there's if there's a, an increase, so either a low level viremia in the first one and then above a thousand for the second one, then you would know that your suspicions were right and there was actually underlying resistance. Or what they said, even if the first viral load is let's say 100 copies and the second one is 800 copies, Yes, they're both low-level viremias, but there was quite a big increase there. And in that case, you would suspect that the next one is probably above 1,000 because of underlying resistance. Whereas if they are roundabout in the same ballpark or the second one is slightly lower than the first, they said it's much less likely that there would be resistance mutations. And that's why they said they are comfortable with us switching these patients to TLB. So, I mean, these are expert opinions. I think there's not that much hard evidence for us in the literature about this. Um, but that's what I'm feeling comfortable with as, as um, according to that explanation that we received from them. Mm -hmm. So, Tinyigo, since you also agreed to transition to TLD, um, would the, the actual level of the LLV uh, make it easy or difficult for you? So let's presume that uh, it was 800, uh, this LLV versus, uh, I mean, having looked at what some of the graphs are showing, um, are you comfortable with the same approach if the low level viremia was way above um, 500? It would not make any difference, even if it's, let's say it's 999, <laughs> let's say it's 900 <laughs> for, yeah. for, for argument's sake. Because yeah. once you have a patient in category B, you are looking at it, is it a blip? or is the patient going into failure? Mm -hmm. And as I said, with the NNRTIs, this is a situation where you, would, you are still having viral replication. Mm -hmm. But in, 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 <laughs> when you talk of failure, I'm looking at failure as like more than a thousand for now. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're looking at, uh, this patient is not failing but they may be on the way to failure. But remember, when you talk of failure, you are taking into account the mutations that have come forth. Studies have shown that if you are looking at 
uh, uh, the viral load, like the category B uh, 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 viral load, most especially with your K65 Rs. Your K65Rs, which are like turnover base, is not something that uh, 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 you would detect at that level. And that is why the comfort in terms of having to use the uh, 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 Lutegravir, which will be able to squash it within, in fact, within a week or two. So that is the, uh, the issue. Category B is category B, irrespective of whether I'm looking at it, where, uh, a person coming in with a viral load of 65 and thereafter a viral load of 150 or a viral load of 100, thereafter coming with a viral load of 700. You categorize it like that. And if you are to act within that three months of like the two viral loads, you should be able to, 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 to suppress. And studies have shown that, yeah. Thank you, thank you. I, I have a, a great backup <laughs> today and I'm really enjoying um, uh, this, you know. So just to sum it up, to say that um, studies do show that patients with uh, LLV are predisposed to subsequent biological failure. And I think uh, the Nugo sort of put it into context to say this patient is not yet failing, but uh, is likely to fail and probably the patient is likely to fail if we don't act. I think that's the, the, the message um, I'm, I'm getting um, right there. And particularly if the low level viremia is at a high level, you know, um, those are, are, are the issues. Studies also showed a five times increased risk of virological failure for those with high low level um, um, viremias. And it's quite important that we take time to assess our patients, look at some of the reasons why they might have a high um, viral load, look at the context, but also assess each patient really as they come in. And I also want to encourage you to always have uh, someone with, with quite an experience um, in the field to call so that uh, you can discuss these kinds of cases. Um, um, and then we, we take it um, from there. So, that was my, my teaser there, really, to the panel to say, so you are happy with the uh, national guidelines or you think uh, in the next few years um, we need to be a bit robust and consider, because I see the clinician society, they are solid to say 50. You saw the American uh, people are saying anything above 200, you know, um, um, should be classified as treatment failure. I will come back to you in your closing remarks uh, to try and engage you on this. But uh, just for the few minutes to look at some of the, the questions, I'm gonna start uh, uh, with the Q&A. Do I still switch in patients with high viral load uh, with confirmed poor compliance? Um, 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 Christy, let's take uh, uh, 10 seconds for each of this. There's uh, Duduetang, he's asking if uh, she should be switching if a uh, treatment failure is confirmed, but there's poor compliance. What's your take? Just a quick five second answer. Yeah, that's not a five second answer. <laughs> <let's say. laughs> I think it, it very much depends what regimen the patient is on. If the patient yes. is on an efavirenz based regimen, we know that poor compliance very, very quickly leads, leads to resistance. So we can't just keep on giving them time, giving them time. Um, it, it might also depend on the CD4 count. The lower the CD4, the more aggressively we'd want to act, especially if they've got opportunistic infections, TB or something like that. Um, I would I would work on the adherence and switch the patient at the same time if they've got specific risk factors like comorbidities, um, pregnancy, low CD4. Um, patients on dolitegravir or Olivia, obviously we will continue doing adherence counseling for a lot longer. Um, mm -hmm. But the efavirenz patients, we really, at some clinics or some facilities, we end up seeing patients failing efavirenz for three years, four years, five years. I think the longest I've seen was seven or eight years on the same regimen. We really mm -hmm. can't do that. Even if there's poor adherence, at some point we need to make a regimen switch, but it's, it's not an easy one. Sorry, that mm -hmm. wasn't five seconds. <laughs> no, it's okay. I'm just putting you under pressure. And then uh, uh, Diego Manuko has a case. He says the patient was started in 2016 on TEE, never suppressed until June. And then she says that the patient was wrongly switched to... I think she wants to say ALD, Zidovudin, Lamivudin, Dolutegrave, never used the PI. I'm not sure if the patient was wrongly switched, uh, mm -hmm. but what's your take on that? I just think probably someone did the right decision at some point. <laughs> I'm trying to understand this question. Yeah, uh, yeah. so I think- What's this? 
I don't think there's a question, but Manoku, it seems like mm. someone picked up that the patient had been failing for a while and yes. decided to switch a patient correctly. So just do your viral load. If the patient is suppressed on Zidovudin, Lamivudin, Dolutegrave, please just continue um, on that. If the patient is taking AZT, Lamivudin, and TLD on top of that, we need to reduce the number of uh, drugs um, that the patient is taking. I think it's a, it's, it's a, she put it, you know, as a statement. So I was not sure. Yeah, I think. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, I think with this, if a patient has been on TEE and has been failing uh, 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 throughout, and the switch that she has put forth, AZT3TC and Dolutegrave, not TLD, it will be AZT3TC and Dolutegrave. But let's just check that, is it really TLD or not? You, you see how she has put it forth. But <laughs> the second line would be AZT3TC and Dolutegrave for this patient, and then yeah. you would follow her up in terms of um, her viral load. Yes, and I think also when she says never used lopina there, it might she might be thinking that we should always uh, move from a favorite to lopina there before we go to DTG, and that is not um, the case. Yeah, our current yeah. guidelines we are really punting for patients like, in fact, we will find patients who are on uh, regimen one on dolutegrave. And then you have got those that are on regimen two. Let's say a patient had been failing TEE like this patient, the patient will be on AZT3TC and Dolutegrave. And you may have patients who would be on a second line, the, the, the current second line, which is AZT3TC and uh, a boosted uh, Lopinave who are failing. And then when we do a resistant test, you will find that uh, uh, the other drug that they would use would be a, a dolutegrave. So you would have patients who are on regimen one on dolutegrave, regimen two on dolutegrave, regimen three on dolutegrave. What we are going to look at it will be the backbone, which will give us a sense as to what is happening with that patient. Great, great, great. I'm happy about that. Christy, someone says, what should one do with patients who have high viral loads on a PI plus tenofovir uh, and emtricitabine for more than two years. As they were trying to prepare to switch the patient, then the viral load is now LLV, is between 500 and 600. Uh, and then resistance test, they did it. It shows some mutations to TDF and lamivudine, but no resistance to the PI. <laughs> Ooh, Christy, yeah. Hi, yeah, Christy. That's also, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, sure. That's also an interesting one. It means that there was just really some adherence issues, and when the decision was made to do a resistant to do a yeah to, to do a resistance test, um, clearly the clinician strongly suspected that there was PI resistance, and it seems like the test showed that it was actually not because firstly the viral load managed to suppress to less than six hundred, um, mm. and the PI showed susceptibility. So um, we know from several big studies, including the Ernest study, that it doesn't really matter what NRTIs we put with the PI. Even if the NRTIs are resistant, the patient can end up suppressing as long as the alluvia or the atizana, the, the protease inhibitor, is still susceptible. Um, so in this case, the one option would be to keep the patient on his alluvia regimen. Doesn't matter what we add to it, can be the tenofovir and 3TC, can be AZT and 3TC. Tenofovir is probably a nicer one, slightly more tolerable than the AZT. Um, what I'm wondering about is um, the other option would be to give dolutegrave, um, mm. depending if the patient has ever had AZT. The fact that we've got proven TDF resistance, we would not give the patient TLD. But if the patient has never had AZT or the resistance test showed AZT fully susceptible, we could actually give dolutegrave and AZT 3TC, which would be three tablets a day. It would still be a BD regimen, but it would be three tablets a day and might be more tolerable than an alluvia regimen. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that would be yeah, my I thought. think we would need to assess adherence, especially side effects, diarrhea and so on from the PI. And if uh, those things are an issue, then I think AZT, Lamivudin, Dolutegrave. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, it just shows that most patients whom we think are failing, they are not actually failing. Um, Tinyego, here's, uh, I will choose one from Anonymous again. Um, how do we manage a client? Uh, just question two, ne, Tinyego, on this case. How do, you, do we manage a client who had a viral load of 850 on TEE? And then now they were switched to TLD, 
Now the viral load seems to be increasing. It's 1,002, they repeated after three months, it's 1,000 or high. Should they switch? Should they wait for two years? Or what must they do? Hey. <laughs> the patient had, uh, was on category B and then switched to TLD. TLD, yes. And, now and they are not after high. switching to TLD, it continues to increase. Yes. Okay, I think we go back to basic, you know, the A, B, C, D, E in terms of making sure that like, you, you do your adherence. Is there any issues that speaks to co-infection? Is the um, drug drug interaction? You do that A, B, C, D and make sure that all is done. Uh, with this one, I wouldn't uh, 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 really wait. You know, you have got this thing of waiting for like uh, two years. Remember mm -hmm. this one, we have switched this patient with query go this patient was switched on the basis of category b mm -hmm. and there was no resistant tense that would have been done for that this on an individual base i would like to have a a, a peep on the resistant test for this patient dolutegravir i know we will not have problems with it but that uh, uh, uh i'm suspicious of the k65 r coming in as long as you have uh, excluded all the others in terms of A, B, C, D, E. You can't just keep the patient on TLD uh, uh, throughout for two years, considering that this patient had prior tenofovir, uh, uh, was, well, was on tenofovir prior to that. Mm, yeah, this is a, is a case to be discussed with an experienced clinician. Yes. And the and the and the the, the, the anonymous <laughs> question there is asking: Should I change to the tenofovir to AZT? And and I think those are the things that need to be discussed. But I think A B C D E is quite important that we go through it and we ensure that we are not missing poor adherence and other issues that that can easily be um, addressed um, at that point in time. Um, Raymond is asking. As a follow-up, a viral load of 600 to 450 show that the virus is not multiplying. Again, any switch, the virus is not multiplying. <laughs> I think it's multiplying. It might be multiplying slower than, than it would have. Um, and and the, the recommendation there, Raymond, is that we try and use uh, and switch the patient to TLD if they are taking um, tenofovir emtricitabine and uh, effavirenz. So I, I, I think um, that is fine. Um, let's look at the last one, Rele Wihile says, if a client defaulted treatment and was reinitiated on TLD and the viral load was high uh, at that point in time, the CD4 count remains under 50, what would be the next step? Rele Wihile, your question is quite, uh, uh, I can't get what the question is. Maybe um, is the last question on the Q and A, um, um, Christy. I'm not sure if you you are gathering what the the question might be, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure if the question is just that the patient has got an undetectable viral load, but the CD4 remains low. There was uh, a similar question in the chat box that also said what to do if the viral load is suppressed and the CD4 remains low. Um, maybe we can talk to that for a second and then they can okay. clarify if that wasn't really the question. Yes. Um, yes. So I usually have three answers to that question. Um, well, the first important point to make is if the viral load is suppressed, we don't have to change the ARV regimen unless there's side effects or the patient is not tolerating it, but not for, for the low CD4. But we do, however, have to investigate why the CD4 is low. It's possible that patients who had an extremely low CD4 at art initiation will take quite long for the CD4 to recover. Um, but if the CD4 is actually dropping, we need to find out why. And there's three main things we need to exclude. The one is a serious opportunistic infection, especially something that can um, suppress the bone marrow. So we're mm -hmm. mostly thinking of TB in our setting. So a, a very good TB workup should be done, but any other serious infection that could cause this must also be excluded. Secondly, an underlying malignancy must be um, excluded, especially the hematological malignancies, leukemias, lymphoma, um, but other sites of cancer as well can, can depress the CD4. And then thirdly, um, there are drugs that can actually interact with the body and cause myelosuppression and decrease the CD4. And the most um, common one in our setting 
um, sort of counterintuitively is actually Bactrim. We give Bactrim to patients with a low CD4, but in certain patients, the Bactrim actually suppresses the bone marrow and causes the patient's CD4 to remain low. So almost in a you know, counterintuitive action, sometimes if we've excluded cancer, we've excluded opportunistic infections, it's actually worth carefully withdrawing the Bactrim for let's say a three month period, repeating the violet and see if it bounces back. Because um, remember, Bactrim is not supposed to actually boost the CD4. Bactrim is supposed to protect us from opportunistic infections while the CD4 recovers, while the immune system recovers. So if the immune system is not recovering, it might be actually the Bactrim that's causing it not to recover. So that would be the three things to keep in mind. Um, infections, cancer, and drugs that is actually suppressing the bone marrow, which Bactrim is one, but there are others as well. Great, great, great. Um, two more um, questions, and then after that, I want us to sum up the evening. I see everyone is still here. Um, the, you got this one from Rabusa. It's on the chat, ne? not on the Q&A. Uh, she is saying that in our clinic, we have observed a moderate occurrence of a slight increase in the viral load between 80 and 600 in patients previously well controlled on TEE and now transitioned to TLD. Um, he says, what could be the reason? Could this be medication or herbal? Or, or are we not overrating DTG? Because these people were previously fully suppressed. Um, I don't know, Tiniko, what's your take? I know you're going to take us to basics. <laughs> Yeah, the yeah. issue with uh, uh, dolutegravir, it's not like we are overrating dolutegravir, the potency of dolutegravir, we have data that shows patients starting with baseline viral loads of millions and uh, being able to, to suppress. I think it's important as clinicians to, as you're saying, go back to basics. Patients who would have uh, suppressed and now they come in, they, they come in with, a, with a detectable viral load. We still go back to those A, B, C, D. You will be surprised what, uh, uh, what comes forth. Mm. I would not uh, switch. Uh, I would still continue them on, D, uh, on the dolutegravir and make sure that the A, B, C, D, E uh, uh, comes forth. Part of the reason why we are even saying that when you have patients that would have started on a dolutegravir or a PI-based therapy, and uh, they still have a, a detectable viral load. In more than 99.9.5% of the case, it speaks to adherence. Adherence, yeah. So yeah, um, Christy, the last question is that, it is not a question, I saw a comment in the chat, someone saying, I must emphasize the issue of viral loads um, and pregnancy. Um, I'm trying to think uh, in, in the context, how important is low level viremia in pregnancy? I mean, how urgent is it to get these patients to fully suppress? I mean, what's your take? Should we follow? Um, because the protocol which I shared talks about repeating in three months, then repeating again, you know, in six months and so on. But in pregnancy, we don't have the time. So how would you match the two? Um, considering that the viral load is not even above a thousand. Um, um, Christy? Yeah, thanks. The PMTCT topic was actually something that I wanted to address in my last remark. So I'll just do that now because um, yeah. I don't think it was really part of these slides. Um, yeah. But we do need to keep in mind that the PMTCT viral load guidelines are different from these ones that were shared, which are for normal adults um, and, and children. And in PMTCT, we know that if a viral load is raised to be more than a thousand, we repeat the viral load after just one month, which is why it's so crucial to find these patients quickly as soon as the result comes out. Don't wait for them to come to the next appointment. Um, call them, get them in, counsel them so that the viral load can be repeated after a month to see if there's at least one log drop. And then when it comes to the low level viremia between 50 and 999, the re uh, repeated viral load is actually after two months. So it's still sooner than the three months. It's still an active management. We are not actually ignoring these patients. We need to do that enhanced adherence counseling, and we need to repeat the viral load after two months in pregnancy. Um, okay. And then as for implications, we know that if we, look, if, we, if we look at it from the mom's side, um, it is more of a, a priority because we can see that even the guidelines are prompting us to 
do active management to get the mom suppressed. But then from the baby's point of view, by the time the mom is breastfeeding um, or, the, or the baby is born in any case, um, as long as the viral load is less than a thousand, the guidelines allow us to treat the baby as low risk. When it comes to infant prophylaxis, we only give high risk infant prophylaxis, which is our ideal prophylaxis for those with viral load above a thousand. So I'm sure that's also a debatable issue. And I'm sure some women would prefer to give dual prophylaxis to their babies if they know that they're viral load, even if it's just 200 copies. Um, if it was me, I would probably prefer that. Um, but it's interesting that the guideline actually treats the mom as high risk and the baby as low risk in the case of low level viremia. But definitely, I mean, we know that low level viremia is a risk for progressing to full on biological failure. So pregnant and breastfeeding women, definitely we need to pay a lot of attention to them, even just with a low level viremia, because we don't want them to progress in the wrong direction, end up failing and infecting their babies. Great, great, yeah. So now to the last, last question of the day. Thank you very much, Christy, uh, for that. Uh, coming back to you, uh, Dr. Koza. <laughs> so are you happy with the, um, um, our definition of treatment failure? Should we go to 50? Should we go to 200? Or you are happy with 1,000? And, uh, and, and, and what are your reasons for or against? And then after that, Christy will also do the same. And then we really call it the night. Thanks. Yeah, the definition of virological failure at a thousand, I'm happy with it. Uh, I'll pack it, I'll, I'll come back to, to, to that. The issue is uh, when you look at the epidemiology, we look at uh, HIV per se within like globally, you know, we've got about 38 million people that are infected, two thirds are in the sub-Saharan Africa. And when you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, we are sitting with about 7.2 to 7.8 million people that uh, are infected. So if we were to have like 95% of those patients who would be on uh, antiretrovirals, yes, would like everyone to have suppressed. Yeah. But the reality is uh, from 2004, that's when we have had uh, patients that uh, like the rollout in terms of uh, uh, roll out to the public for everyone to have antiretrovirals. So we need to take into account that we have got quite a number of patients that are experienced in terms of HIV, uh, uh, HIV treatment, and not let's not negate the issue of the primary HIV resistance. Maybe it's something that you may uh, deal with some other time, the issue of primary HIV resistance. We start our patients on antiretrovirals from, uh, uh, and we know six months down the line, we expect them to have suppressed. And you have patients that would have genuinely taking their treatment, uh, 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 being adherent, and six months down the line, you do their you do their viral loads, their viral loads, they are still not suppressed. Mm -hmm. And yes, we think yes, it's adherence, which is top on the list. You 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 repeat after three months, they are still up like that. So those are the issues that one will need to take into account. That if the viral load is more than a thousand, this is where one would need to act accordingly to say that yes, we are dealing with failure. The viral load of uh, within category B, we are not talking it in terms of failure. We are looking at it in terms of, yes, you have viral replication. That is why you have, you, you have got viral replication, but not yet going into failure. That's why the element of a bleep. We can't just take it like you have a viral load that is more than a thousand, that is more than a, a sort of viral load of more than 50, you need to act. And acting goes back to those A, B, C, D, E. But mm. one wouldn't just decide to switch mm. with regards to that. It's a low level viremia, meaning that you have got viral replication taking place, which has got a potential to go into failure. And failure as in like a viral load of more than a thousand. I know you take into account, uh, 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 there are guidelines that speaks of a viral load of 500 or a viral load of 200 based on uh, studies that has come forth. But the studies that have come forth, we look at it as to how much power was there for us to can say that here we are at 500 and 500 is a failure. For us, considering the, uh, 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 the prevalence of HIV within our, uh, uh, within our setup, the issue of failure, we take it as such. The fact that the 
the, the guidelines accommodate for us to have that hawk eye on the category B. It gives us a leverage to be able to act before patients go into that uh, thousand. Other than that, we would have, if you are to look at uh, the, the, the third 95 as to where we are, you would, you, we would really have a problem where you'd find ourselves having to switch each and every patient yeah, who is coming to switch to second line for each and every patient. So you take into account the, 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 our prevalence, the dynamics at which we find ourselves in, and the fact that it has worked, the category B part where we are supposed, where we are able to, 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 to switch our patient accordingly in terms of not necessarily switching to second line, but switching accordingly based on what they are, whether they are on NNRTI or whether they are on a PI or, a, or an integrase inhibitor-based therapy. So it gives us a leverage in terms of that. Great. We are not Great. negating those studies, but the power of those, uh, it still yeah, becomes questionable. Thank you, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Uh, Christy, on the same um, as you close uh, the session. Thanks. Yeah, I think Tanika and I are sort of on the same page with this. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily worry too much about switching them before we get to a viral load of a thousand. I think the important thing to think though, to, to, to realize though, and it's, it's a bit of a mind switch that we've seen in the guidelines from the old ones to the current ones is that a low level viremia is not just there to be ignored. Yes, mm -hmm. we might not be switching them immediately, but we still definitely need to manage them actively. And the guideline prompts us to do the violet after three months and do enhanced adherence counseling in the meantime, then repeat it again after six months if it's still there. We are not just ignoring them. A violet of 400 or 600 or what doesn't mean now we did the violet in two November and it came back and it was low level viremia. It's fine. We can do it again next year, November and just leave the patient as is. So we are not ignoring them. We are not doing nothing. Yes, we might not be switching them, but we are really actively managing them, or we should be actively managing them. Um, and then at the same time, I think like from a, from an individual point of view, if that patient is sitting in front of you as the clinician, you definitely have that responsibility to actively manage them. Have the conversation, do your enhanced adherence counseling, check for side effects, check for drug interactions, do the whole full thing. But on the other hand, if we look at it from a public health point of view, just thinking of these weekly reports that we get from NHLS, if we look at a district level or a, or a provincial level, at the numbers of unsuppressed patients that we that are sent through on a, on a weekly basis, um, almost two thirds of them are actually your low level viremias. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's a high, high, high number that are not, you know, it's a, it's a smaller number with less than 1,000 and quite a high number between 50 and 999. So there are a lot of them out there that should be managed. But if we're going to put all our attention on them, we're not going to end up managing those ones with more than a 1,000 because they're going to take all our time. So I think from a public health point of view, we still need to prioritize the patients with viral loads above a thousand. They are the ones who are already failing. They are the ones who are going to drop their CD4s faster and get opportunistic infections faster. So we should still prioritize those ones with above a thousand. But then keep in mind that we can't ignore the large number of low level viremias. We do need to actively manage them to prevent them from heading towards the above a thousand. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that would be. Oh, and then just just to comment on one thing that you said, I think somewhere you mentioned that um, we repeat the viral load after three months, and we hope by God's grace that they will suppress. And um, I'm a full believer in God's grace, but it's not God's grace alone that's going to suppress them. It's our active management. It's that adherence plan that we need to create with the patient. If we just pray and hope on God's grace, you'll might just find the viral load remaining the same or going up. So yeah, just emphasizing active management, even of low level viremias. But thank you so much. I think it's been a great session. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Christy, um, 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 Diego. I really appreciate. I, I I am also looking at the comments. Everyone seems to be satisfied. Just to close this session and say, let's remember: if someone presents with a low level viremia 
uh, like Christy said, let's not hope on grace only. Let's really do you know the work, properly assess your patient, have a plan with the patient, collaborate, partner with the patient, repeat it in three months time. Um, if it's still low level viremia, the guidelines do allow for you to delay a bit up to six months. And then if it's still there, consider switching to TLD. But I like also what the Nico said to say, don't just follow this for all patients, contextualize it, assess the history, the drug history, history of drug changes, you know, what was the viral load before, you know, you did the switches and so on, so that you can really, you know, personalize the care um, that we need for each individual patient. All right. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, for your time, for attending. I know it's in the evening after a long day and I see you stayed. I thought today we were going to stick to 60 minutes, but I think uh, it was quite an engaging and, and interesting. And thanks to the panel, thanks to you. I saw a comment about certificates. Remember certificates, you receive them within 24 to 48 hours. However, you need to attend for an hour. If you attend your time, that you are spending on the webinar is less than 60 minutes. Unfortunately, you can't receive um, a CPD point. That's the law, it's regulated like that. Otherwise, send us uh, an email for any inquiries at info at the clinicalcareplatform.com. I hope to see you again um, next week, Tuesday. I will talk to my panelists and also see if they are willing to come back um, to teach. Okay, thank you, God bless you. Enjoy your evening.